Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. Worldwide, there are now more than 4.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, with more than 300,000 deaths. I mean, it's just, just an astonishing number. This weekend marked the first time in weeks that the majority of states had some easing of lockdown measures. While researchers are still learning about the virus, what seems to be true of COVID-19 is that it moves with close interaction. But many public health officials believe masks in public, continued social distancing, and telecommuting should be our baseline, our basic baseline for the near future, even as the U.S. considers reopening fully. And just as the U.S. lifts restrictions, at least six countries went back to partial lockdown mode after seeing their own spikes in infection rates come back. Could that scenario be in the cards for us? Joining me to explore that is Dr. Tom Inglesby. His work in the area of public health preparedness, pandemics, and emerging infectious diseases is sought out globally. This weekend on Meet the Press, Inglesby told Chuck Todd that given that there are more than 100 clinical trials underway in the search for a vaccine, that his own skepticism that we could produce a vaccine soon is reducing a bit. And that given the resources, the focus, and the global collaboration involved now, he's more hopeful, but a little bit hopeful. Dr. Inglesby is the director of the Center for Health Security of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been watching your statements, which are everywhere carefully, and I'd love to just get a sense right now of your dashboard of what is going well and what is not going well as we all battle this, this virus. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think what's going well is that uh, the messages around physical distancing and masks and avoiding gatherings and telecommuting, I think people are hearing those messages and largely responsive to them. Obviously, it's not universal, and there is some there are some people in the country who are not necessarily persuaded of those actions. But I think overall, uh, collectively, we should be happy as a country that we've been able to change the trajectory of the epidemic. We had the largest we we continue to have the largest epidemic in the world, but we've been able to change that trajectory. <clears throat> We've been able to slow it uh, considerably in, in around the country, not in all states, but in, in many places, in the majority of states of the country have been able to either have it come to a um, uh, at least not increasing numbers. And in many places, we do have decreasing numbers state to state. So those things I'm very happy about. Um, I think there still is, um, what I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about is that some uh, sense by some uh, that uh, this may be over in you know in June or that this may end soon and that we'll com be completely back to where we were before. That's not going to happen. This virus is still circulating in our country. It's still circulating in the world. It's causing terrible damage um, in countries around the world. In some places, many many countries have increasing numbers of cases on a day to day basis that that are rising pretty sharply. So we're going to have to find a way to live with this virus until we have a vaccine. And I, and I think the, the measures that we've been talking about are the most important ones, even as we reopen. I mean, I'm so happy that you talked about the world, because I think a lot of our focus has been what's happening in the United States. But, you know, there's a network. This came from a, a, a foreign place. Um, it has been it has sped so dramatically because of travel and interactions around the world. Johns Hopkins, you know, you're at Johns Hopkins, but it is one of the hubs of the smartest people in the world in this. And you interact with all the other smart people in the world. I, I, I hate to ask, put it this way, but I mean, is there a sense of realism that uh, like you're saying amongst these scientists and researchers who are doing battle in this, that this is going to be long? Because I'm hearing a lot of green sprout talk that, you know, we're going to be close. I heard your comments on Chuck Todd um, that you thought we were going to be closer than you might otherwise have thought. So, I mean, just just be straight with us. I mean, do you yeah. do you sense from your colleagues that they think this is going to be a shorter road than we would normally have? Well, yeah, I didn't mean to imply on the uh, on the discussion with Chuck Todd yesterday that that it's going to be a short road, even if we do have a vaccine at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. That still needs to be produced on a large scale. It still needs to be distributed to places around the world. It would not all be ready at the same time. So even if we do have a vaccine at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, there there will be a, a lot of work to do both in the U.S. and around the world to get it to people to figure out who are at the highest, <clears throat> who's at highest risk, who's who should be at the highest priority for getting the vaccine. I do think everything would have to go in, in the right direction for us to have a vaccine by the end of this year, the beginning of next year. There are lots of ways that it might not work. 
in the event that the vaccine doesn't prove to be as safe as we hope it would be or as effective. So um, I think many in the community are are um, not convinced yet that that's a, that's a possible timeline, but there are others who, who believe that if everything goes in the right direction, it's possible we could begin to have the manufacture of vaccine at the beginning of 2021, January, that time scale that Tony Fauci and Monsef Slawi have talked about publicly. Um, one of the things we're noticing is that, that sometimes populist leaders around the world are not um, really thrilled to have scientists around, or uh, at least that's the way it looks to me. And I think in the United States, we see somewhat of a struggle right now, a kind of tug of war between those who say we need to follow what scientists say, you know, create um, health guardrails that are informed by empirical study and by science versus the politics of just giving people what they want. How do, I mean, you're, you, you sit in Maryland, you sit and you, you were watching this play out in that state, but also nationally. What are the best insights you have on how to resolve that tension? Well, I, I do think it needs to be a partnership between political leadership and public health input and scientific input. I think uh, one without the other won't work. Um, but we see that in, in countries around the world, some of the countries that have great success, like New Zealand, uh, have a, there's a very close partnership between p- political leadership and public health leadership. And um, it's a model that's worked before. And I think it's going to continue to be important throughout our response in the United States. We're going to need to have the input of scientific and, and public health leaders because things are going to keep evolving. Different challenges will emerge, both with our public health response, with new therapies, with new new clinical developments that we learn about with this virus. Even in the last month, we've seen this virus can do things that we didn't anticipate at, as recently as April. So there will need to be a very close partnership between scientific leaders and political leaders. And uh, <clears throat> I think the, the, the role of CDC is very important and we should make sure that CDC continues to have a strong voice in the country they have in all past outbreaks. Uh, and since I can remember, and they should continue to to bring their expertise to bear. We have thousands of people working at CDC on epidemic response, and they're very important. We also have amazing federal agencies like NIH, FDA, BARDA, ASPR, and a really strong research community in this country. So hopefully those voices will be able to help usefully shape the response and bring political leaders the input they need to make good decisions. Tom, I've had people on here like Senator, former Senator, uh, Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, Senator Coons, um, many that have been involved, both Republican and Democrat, in like looking ahead and looking at what infrastructure, particularly manufacturing agility and other dimensions of this mm-hmm. challenge that um, in expecting a future pandemic, now the pandemic is here, and some warn that there may be one coming up. How do we go from this moment of fighting the current fire to being much smarter about the future? I know this is an area that you've spent a lot of time on, but I I worry myself in Washington that once we get to a point where things are opening up, that we forget um, about the investment needed in protecting ourselves from the next pandemic, which some people like Senator Kuhn said is expected to be far worse than what we're experiencing now. Yeah, there has been a, a definitely a cycle in uh, public health response to infectious disease emergencies. There is a lot of attention at the moment of an event. And then in the years that follow, there's a period of kind of you know loss of attention. People move on. Political leaders have other priorities that emerge. So hopefully this the, the traumatic nature of this event is so compelling that there is a bipartisan consensus that we need strong public health programs in this country. We need to spend more money on vaccine development, which could change everything. There's been a, there has been a dramatic shortening of the timeline of, of vaccine development around the world in the last 15 years because of loss of investment. But having a, waiting a year or 18 months to have a new vaccine when with this kind of pandemic ravaging the world, we should just all collectively say that's unacceptable and we will spend the money needed to shorten vaccine timelines dramatically before we have a, another pandemic that that's that's on top of us. So we need to make big investments in vaccine development that are sustained. We need to change the way we think about our, our supply chain. We, we can't be in a position where only a few countries are providing masks, gowns, gloves, eye protection, and everyone needs them at the same time in the world. That you know We saw our doctors and nurses in March uh, having to go take care of COVID patients without 
uh, the proper equipment. We can't let that happen again. We have to prepare our healthcare systems better. I think you're right that we do need political leaders to recognize that this is not just one moment, but this is a threat that could recur again. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully that is the kind of thing that emerges. We've seen a lot of mm. bipartisan consensus on the response so far. And now we need to think about the building of the of the elements we need to protect ourselves in the future. Now, uh, I just want my, my audience, which is a lay audience, to understand, because what you just said is very important, that we need to invest in vaccines for future things. I've interviewed Dr. Anthony Fauci in the past, and he said we need to invest in something like a platform vaccine. And there are groups out there like CEPI, the Coalition for um, Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, to look at some sort of platform that's less reactive, as I understand it, and more proactive in anticipating what's coming our direction. Why should the American public paying for this have trust in that track? What, why, what makes that, because it sounds easy to say, well, let's uh, anticipate a vaccine and create in the future, but is it really doable? Well, um, I don't think we'll know until we try, but certainly we've seen a, a lot of new technology development in the last few years, and platforms are a way of using a, a structure that can be replicated for new vaccines, something that works for one vaccine. We use a platform, it works for one vaccine, it gets through the whole approval process. We use that same platform and build on that, but insert what we need to for the next vaccine. Uh, that's a way of shortening the timeline. Those kinds of investments around platforms are one of the idea, one of the important ideas about how we might shorten the timeline to get new vaccines in the future. There are others, and um, it sometimes is hard to find political support for preparing for things that don't yet exist, for unknown viruses of the future, unknown threats that will come across the horizon that we haven't prepared for. But that's what we need to do. CEPI, the organization you mentioned before, was working on another coronavirus vaccine that's called MERS uh, over the last couple of years and had many contracts that are moving towards addressing MERS. And we're able to build on that, build on that success in, in issuing new contracts, getting new, new companies involved in COVID. So I think they've got a good model organizationally for doing that, but also we need the support from the Congress and the administration to focus on focus on unknown threats in the future. How do we prepare ourselves? How do we get the right programs in government, the right investment? Tom, I think you're advising Governor Hogan, right, in Maryland? Did I read that yes, correctly? Yes, I'm on so, his committee, yes. Right, so Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, I, I happen to live in Maryland as well and have been impressed with how that's it. And I'm, I'm interested in your insights in that process because Larry Hogan's a Republican uh, governor of Maryland. He's you know, tried to strike various partnerships with different stakeholders in this question. And we see different models and examples. What do you think is a success, uh, what do you think a, a successful governor looks like in the era of coronavirus? What can they get right and what can they get wrong? We don't have to name names unless you want to, but I'm interested in what you think the characteristics are of very smart decision making uh, in this time with high stakes consequences for these. And we'll leave it there. Yeah, well, um, I, I have been very impressed with uh, Governor Hogan's approach to this. Uh, I, I, right from the beginning, I think he was, he was uh, t asking for scientific advice, public health input, hospital-based input, uh, as he was making decisions about, about um, stay-at-home orders or um, social distancing measures. And I've also been impressed that he is, um, he thinks it's very important to wear a mask for himself personally to wear a mask in public. He's been very clear about the the need to wear masks when people are in, in indoor spaces uh, outside of their homes. Uh, he's been very clear about physical distancing, the importance of avoiding gathering. So he's been very clear with his messages and he's been um, very methodical and seeks the input of outside uh, scientific public health folks um, consistently. I think um, as a model, I think for the country, I think it's gonna be really important for political leaders to continue to communicate how important it is to do, in, to take individual actions, even as they're opening their own states by various processes, they're either opening businesses or whatever their steps people are taking, governors are taking, it's gonna be very important for them to continue to say how, how, how vital it is to continue individual physical distancing. And I think governors that are doing that well, that's a, that's a really important part of leadership right now.
Well, I want to thank you, Tom Inglesby, and I also just want to make a comment because you have a lot of folks watching this that you know, we, we sometimes take for granted your time. I mean, you're on all the shows. There are other folks I know in the public health sphere <laughs> who are not normally in this in, in such demand. So I want to thank you for giving us such a, a, a big portion of your, your time to share these um, thoughts. So thank you so much, and thank all of you for joining me today. I'm Steve Clemens. We'll see you tomorrow. Be well. Thank you.